really appreciate Jenny and Shannon uh, being so transparent, sharing their marriage story with us, and really would encourage you, if you're not part of a group and you're trying to connect, like that is a great way to do so. Uh, there is the marriage mentors that you can be a part of. So uh, Titus teaches us the older men and women teach the younger men and women. So maybe you are a younger couple and you would like to learn from an older couple. Uh, that is something that you can do. So the marriage mentors also... Uh, uh, if you are married, uh, we have the incredible privilege of having uh, a, a weekend to remember coming in September uh, here in Tampa. Uh, we have sent all of our pastors and directors, them and their spouse, to a weekend to remember. And two things that every single one of them said. Number one, we just didn't know how excellent it was going to be. Like All of them bragged about how amazing uh, opportunity this weekend was for them. But number two... Every couple said this, we didn't know how desperately bad we needed it. And so I don't know where you are, but would encourage you if you're married to do a weekend to remember. It's going to be in Tampa, September the 27th through the 29th. If you use group name, not discount code, but group name, Pastor JJ, uh, I think it's a $100, $150 discount for you on the conference, not the hotel. But the good thing is it's in Tampa, so you don't necessarily have to stay at a hotel. Uh, if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn, take those out, turn those on. Titus chapter 3, uh, over the last couple of weeks, we've walked through the book of Titus. There's three chapters, uh, 46 verses make up this book. Uh, it was written to a guy named Titus who Paul sent to the island of Crete, uh, basically to be a church planter. And so today, uh, we're going to finish... Uh, this last chapter, chapter 3, so the past three weeks, we've just kind of been diving into Titus. But I need to give you um, kind of up front about the book of Titus. Uh, there's good news and bad news in chapter 3. It, it reminds me, there was a group of older guys that just loved baseball. They talked about baseball. They watched baseball. They traveled to different cities to see the different stadiums and teams to play. And one day they were in the stands. And uh, one of the guys said, do you think there's going to be baseball in heaven? Like, would that be awesome if there's baseball in heaven? And Well, one of the guys, uh, he had a near-death experience. He had one of those encounters where he thought he saw a light, went to heaven, and came back and shared the experience with the rest of the guys, but mainly to Gary. And he said, Gary, uh, man, heaven was amazing. It was unbelievable. But Gary, I got good news and bad news about heaven. What do you want first? And of course, Gary said, give me the good news. He said, here it is. There's baseball in heaven, Gary. And Gary said, what could be the bad news? He goes, well, you're the starting pitcher tonight. Um, so that's the bad news, right? So there's good news and there's bad news about Titus chapter 3. Uh, obviously, heaven is good news, right? Uh, it's not, that's not bad, but in the, in the context that is before us or the text before us, we're going to see both because we live in a broken world and try as some of us might, you can't hide under a blanket or in a pantry or binging Netflix. So all of those are coping mechanisms that try to bring us peace, but at the end of the day, it doesn't work. Uh, there is peace, however, and it's found not in one of those mechanisms. It's actually found in a person. Uh, Jesus. Jesus is known as the Prince of Peace. And so today we're going to take a look in Titus 3 at three different points that he's making, really three different journeys uh, that he takes uh, Titus and those in Crete on. But before we look at Titus 3, I want to remind you of a text found in 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 1 and 2 says this. I urge you then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made to all people. So Paul is instructing Timothy, hey, we are to pray for everyone. 
That we are to pray for them, we're to intercede on them, to bring our petitions before God on behalf of them. And I'm so glad at our church that we have a way of doing that for one another. We have the STF Prayer Wall app, and you can pray for the different needs of those in our church. You can also share those needs. But verse 2, he says, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. So 1 Timothy teaches us that we are to pray for everyone, but especially for those in higher positions of authority, that we are to pray for them. So in Titus, we're not necessarily instructed to pray for them. We would say supplication as much as we are subjection, that we are to put ourselves under those in authority. So let's look at it. Titus chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. Paul says to Titus to say to the church plant at Crete, remind the people, that is the believers, So for those who put their faith, hope, and trust in Christ, call themselves a follower of Jesus, a Christian, saved, born again, whatever term, remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, ready to do whatever is good. Now, verse 2 may be some of the hardest teaching in all of the scripture for us today. Slander no one including those in position above you. Slander no one, be peaceable and considerate, and always be gentle towards everyone. It's in both of those passages, in 1 Timothy and in Titus 3. If he hadn't said everyone, if he hadn't said all, like if he would have just said those that we really like, pray for them, be nice to them, that verse would be great. But he says, no, we are to do this for everyone. And here's what he's telling them, that you can disagree without dishonoring. Now, I know that's not necessarily true in our world today uh, because we have this thing called social media and I just won't be your friend anymore. But it is possible that you can disagree with someone without dishonoring the other person. Here's why. Our humility, and one of the characteristics that we should have as a follower of Christ is this thing called humility. Our humility has its greatest opportunity to show up when we disagree with someone. See, if we're always agreeing, there's not really a landing pad for humility to come in on because there's really nothing for us to be humble about. It's when we have this opportunity in disagreement that humility can show off. So those are verses 1 and 2. Now we're going to make a shift. This is so classic Paul. Look in Titus 3, 3, just the first couple words. He says this to them, at one time. Other translations may say for or because. And then he gives one of the clearest, most competent explanations of what the gospel really means than anywhere else in the Bible. And yet I'm going to tell you, like no one ever says, hey, turn to Titus 3 and let me show you what the gospel is, right? Like we always go to Romans or we go to one of the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But the good news is going to be explained in Titus 3. However, there's bad news first. He wants to remind them of who they once were, okay? Titus chapter 3, verse 3. Uh, we had a great service at 9 o'clock, and someone walked out and said, like, I was everything in verse 3. <laughs> like, I, if you would have had us raise our hands, mine would have just stayed up the entire time. Here's what he says. At one time, that, again, that's the reason we got to do verse 1 and 2. At one time, or because, we too... Referring to believers. Now here comes the list. We were foolish. We were disobedient. We were deceived. Enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. That's speaking of their mental and moral behavior before they met Christ. We lived in malice and envy. Being hated and, listen, hating everyone. Isn't that a common word today, right? I hate her. 
I hate him. I hate them and whoever your them may happen to be, right? And, and so in, in verse 3, it's bad news. Because Paul's saying, like, that's who we were. That's where we used to live. And he's reminding Titus of that. He wants to remind the church of that. And I would say he's even reminding us today of don't forget who you were before you experience the grace and the mercy and the love of God. Now, I, I want to pause for a second and remind you, uh, there has to be balance, right? Like, yes, we don't want to forget that we were lost at one time and then we were saved. But you have to be careful that you don't allow the enemy to take you there and to tell you there's no way God could love. Do you see this picture of you? God can't love that. There's no way God can forgive you. And you need to know that's not true. That God does love you. God has forgiven you. So you have to remember whose you are and who you are, that you've been chosen, adopted, you're not forsaken, you are forgiven, you are a child of God, a son or daughter of the king, you are love. Like you have to remember who you are now, but it's important not to forget who you used to be. Think of it like drowning. You don't die from holding your breath, right? Right? You die from breathing in water. Because when, when you're not breathing air, you have to breathe something. Your lungs are going to be filled with something. In a spiritual way, it's like a spiritual breath. When you're not breathing in the glory of God, His, His beauty and the weight that He is deserved, then you're going to find something to breathe in. Because please hear this, our soul can't hold its breath. Like you're breathing something in, okay? And so uh, uh, Titus is being told, hey, don't forget who you used to be. There, there was a person that you were, and then something happened. So how do we go from verse 3, where a lot of us had our hand up through every one of those, right? Everything stated. We're like, yep, I, oh, well, boy, do I remember doing that. Oh, my goodness. Yes, I checked that box. So how do we go from verse 3 to what we are today? I, it's found in verse 5. I, I want you to see this. In verse 5, notice what it says. He saved us, that God picked us out of verse three and he put us in verses five through eight. All right. But how did that happen? He saved us, meaning God saved us. Luke chapter 19, verse 10 gives the purpose, the plan of Jesus coming to earth. Here's what it says. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. What does the loss mean? Separated. Not found, obviously. From like what caused us to be lost? Our sin. John 3 17. Someone said, I didn't honestly, I didn't know there was a verse after John 3 16. Like, are you kidding? Yes, I'm even gonna say this. I think John 3 17 is better than 3 16. Like, this is crazy. Look at John 3 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but watch, but to save the world, how? Through him. Who's the him? Christ. Not us, not the them, right? But through him. The heart of Christianity is that God sent his son to die for us, to save us, something we could not do ourselves. Luke 2.11 um, is this beautiful verse that we normally read around Christmas time, but we should read it like all year round. Uh, Luke 2.11, the angels are declaring to the shepherds the night of Jesus' birth, and notice what they say. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a what? Savior, not a politician, not a philosopher, not a military leader, not a scientist, not an economist, not an entertainer, but what? A Savior. 
So why did God allow a Savior to be born? Because that was our greatest need. We needed saving, therefore we needed a Savior so that we could be forgiven. And so what is this great salvation, right? Uh, Titus chapter 3 is going to share that. So we're going to walk through it. First of all, I please want you to know that all of us are in need of salvation. There's not a single one of you. I don't care how good you are. Uh, I, I don't care the deeds that you could show me or the money that you've given or the church services you've attended or the prayers that you've prayed. We are all in need of salvation. Again, verse 3, we were foolish, we were disobedient, we were deceived, we were serving different lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, being hated and hating others. Meaning this, every single person has sinned. We have all sinned and fallen short of the standard, the glory, the weight, the beauty of Christ. 1 Timothy 1.15 puts it like this. Paul is sharing his story. And he says, here's a trustworthy saying that deserves your acceptance. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. And then he says this, some of you, this could be the one verse you could disagree with, right? You say, not Paul, but me. He says, in whom I'm the worst. (laughs) Like, I was the worst of all sinners, and yet Christ came into the world to even save me. And if you consider yourself the worst sinner, or maybe you say, you know, I think there was one time my mom told me to only take two cookies and... Uh, I took three, Uh, and and that's like the worst thing you've ever done. Even that is sin that separates you from God. You know, this, verse 3, I hate to tell you, this is who we are. And God had 10,000 reasons to condemn us. You know, I think we like to think of ourselves as, you know, we're mostly good. Maybe a rough spot here or there that needs to be sanded down or maybe a couple wrinkles that could be ironed out. But that's not the picture um, that Titus gives of us. Ephesians 2.1 puts it like this. We were dead in our transgressions and sins. Dead is not good, just so you know, Right? Like, it wasn't like we were doing our best and God's like, hey, I'm just going to give you a little boost to kind of help you across the finish line. Not at all. He's not grading us on a curve. Uh, That would be one massive curve he would have to use. So regarding our salvation, I love the way someone put it. I did all the sinning and God did all the saving. That's salvation. Like, what was your part? The sinning? (laughs) What was God's part? The saving. See, it's not the goodness or the good deeds or works in your heart and life that save you. It's the goodness of God that saves us. It was the work of Christ on the cross. So I hope you see, all of us are in need of salvation. That's why Jesus was born. So so what is the source of of our salvation. We'll look in verse 4. But when the kindness, and please hear that word, it's the kind, it wasn't the anger of God, even the wrath of God or the hate of God, but look, when the kindness and the love of God our savior appeared. See, here's the thought. Just like God is, in, is not in verse 3, you and I are not in verse 4. Like God didn't do any of those things that were listed in verse 3. And you and I, we don't do anything listed in verse 4. It was the kindness and the love of God. So the source of salvation, it's God's heart. It's God's love, His mercy, His kindness, His goodness. It's the grace of God. Romans 2.4 puts it like this. God's kindness is intended to lead you or really to woo you, to guide you so that you would repent of those things that you've done and those things that show that you need to be forgiven and that you are in need of a Savior. 
You know, the Bible teaches us that Jesus died in our place. And it wasn't just merely a physical death, even though we can never take away the the physical torture in which Jesus went through. But Jesus died in our place in a far greater spiritual sense. Jesus taking on our sin, the sinless one taking on sin. And so Jesus died the death of a sinner under the wrath of God for the punishment of my sin. Your sins, and we would even say their sins. That's why everyone deserves the opportunity to hear the gospel story, the good news. 1 Peter 3.18 puts it like this. The just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. Like, just look at that verse. The just, Jesus, for the unjust, us. Why? Have you ever just thought, like, why? So that Christ could bring us to God. So we see the need for our salvation. Jesus is the source of that salvation. But let's look at the grounds of our salvation. Look in verse 5. It's not by works of righteousness which you've done. Meaning there are some of you, you've done some great things. Uh, man, there are some of you, your, your, uh, your track record is pretty impressive. But here's the problem. If you and I are not saved by the things we do. Now, this is going to be shocking, so be careful if you put this on social media. You are saved by works. You're just not saved by your works. <laughs> so we are saved by works. We're just not saved by our works. We're saved by the work of Christ on the cross. It is the doing and the dying of Jesus that saves us. Titus 3.5 is a, a, a verse that looks a lot like Ephesians 2.8.9. Look at Ephesians 2.8.9 compared to Titus 3.5. Remember, Titus 3.5 says, not by works of righteousness. Ephesians 2.8.9 says, for by grace, it's God's gift that you are saved Through your faith, so it's not automatic, like you do have to believe and confess. There's faith involved in your part, not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast. Really, the word there is brag. Like nobody can brag. You you can't walk around and go, man, Jesus only had to die a little bit for me to go to heaven. He had to die a lot. for No, it's, he had to die. It doesn't matter. There's no little dying, lot dying. Like Jesus died for all of us. So what is the means then of salvation? Again, verse five, he, God, saved us. Not because of righteous things we've done, but because of mercy. You, do you know the difference? Grace is God giving you something you really You didn't deserve this. It's called grace. It's called a gift. You know what mercy is? God not giving you what you really did deserve. That's called mercy. And as a parent, isn't that a fine line? Like sometimes you're showing your kids grace. Sometimes you have to show your kids mercy. Right? Fine line there. And so there's the means of self. Mercy. Listen listen to this. This could be confusing. This is part of Titus where if you're reading it, you're like, yeah, I have no clue what that means. And you just keep going, right? But watch this. He, meaning God, saved us. How? Through the washing of rebirth. And again, that's the part you go, yeah, I got nothing. (laughs) What does that mean? And by the renewal of the Holy Spirit. So there it is. How Can you and I, who are sinners, separated from a holy God, how can we be reunited? How can we have a a union? Like, how can we become a son or daughter? Well, according to Titus, it's by the washing of rebirth. It's by the washing of regeneration, right? Now, again, you're like, I have zero clue what that means, okay? So let me share with you just a little here of what's taking place. First of all, let me share what it's not. He's not saying by the washing of baptism. So he's not saying, hey, if you were baptized, sprinkled, you know, as a baby, as an infant, as a toddler, even as a teenager or an adult, baptism doesn't say, it's not the washing of water that saves you. 
okay? We are not saved by religious acts or sacraments, meaning it doesn't matter if you've been baptized a hundred times. It doesn't matter if you've taken communion every day for the past 40 years. Like, that doesn't matter. Remember, he just said, we're not saved by our works. So you're not saved by being baptized. You're not saved by taking bread and juice. Like, that doesn't save you. That's great for you to do. It's something Jesus established in the church, that we are baptized and that we participate in communion. Those are good things. But those are not works of salvation. Those are works because of salvation. All right. Look, look at 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. The old is gone, the new is here. How does that happen? If you are in Christ. So if you're saved by your own good works or, or religious acts or sacraments participation, right? Then, then there would be no need for Jesus to have died on a cross. Like, What would be the point of that? And so what we see here, this word, the washing of rebirth or the washing of regeneration, it, it's a figure of speech that he's using that in their context, they would have known this really well. And basically it's the same thought of, you got to be born again. Like you got to experience a spiritual birth. It's, it's a picture that you've been bathed, that you've been washed, that you've been cleansed. Remember Psalm 24 tells us, who can come before the Lord? Those that have clean hands in a pure heart. You've been washed, you've been cleansed, all right? So not by baptism like what we do, but baptism by God, washing you, forgiving you, and the spiritual side of you is born. Uh, maybe this illustration will. Um, Sharon and I have raised three sons, three boys. And uh, I can't tell you how many times uh, we, we said to them, uh, and I don't know if this is good parenting or not, but we said, you are dirty. Like, my goodness, I can smell you from here. Like, you stink. You've got to take a shower. And I can't tell you how many times they have whined about that, complained about I mean, there's times they actually cried because they didn't want to take a shower. And, and we heard, well, I went swimming two days ago. I'm like, even more of a reason you need to take a shower. Like, get in the water. And finally, when you get them in, you can't get them out. And then it's like, do you know how much that shower's costing me right now? Like, get out. I don't know what you, just get out, right? Classic. They didn't want to get in the shower. Then they don't want to get out of the shower, all right? So think about this. This is the picture that Jesus is going to teach in John chapter 13. If you remember John chapter 13, Jesus is with the disciples. He's headed towards the cross. There's this unique phrase, like he's like, go find a cult. It's going to be tied here. Tell two guys that. I mean, like Jesus is super focused because his gaze is toward Calvary. And, and that's the only thing he's thinking about. However, he's going to pause. He's going to participate in what's known as Passover. Jesus, being Jewish, is going to participate in Passover. But in Passover, Jesus is going to do some things different that's ever been done before. All right. So John chapter 13, I think this thought of washing of rebirth, washing of regeneration, you're going to have like an aha moment as the Spirit reveals this through you, through the Scripture, because that's how God speaks, first and foremost. I probably get asked this all the time. Pastor JJ, how do you hear from God? Read the Word? Like, that's how? Like, this is His Word to you. So if you want to hear God speak... Read it. And so I think through the Spirit of God and the Scripture of God, God's going to show, oh, that's what, wow. So look at this, John 13. Jesus knew that the Father, by the way, Jesus being subject to the Father, it's okay to be subject to someone. Remember Titus chapter 3? He's telling us, be subject to them. Jesus knew the Father had put all things under His power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So verse 4. So he got up from the meal. He took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, Jesus poured water into a basin 
he began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Verse 6 says, And then he came to Simon Peter. And Simon Peter said to him, Lord, you're not going to wash my feet. So Peter's like, there's not a chance under the sun that the Son of Man is going to wash my feet. Like, it's not happening, Jesus. And look what Jesus says in verse 7. Peter, you, you don't realize what I'm doing. How many times are we like Peter and we just don't realize what God's doing? It's like, God, this makes no sense whatsoever. And so Jesus said, Peter, you don't realize what I'm doing, but later you're going to understand this. And again, Peter's like, no, like you're never washing my feet. And then Jesus answered, Peter, unless I wash your feet, you don't have any part of me. So Jesus is saying, Peter, that if you don't allow me to wash your feet, we can't be in fellowship, Peter. And if you want to be in fellowship with me, you've got to allow me to do this. I love verse 9. Then, then Simon Peter replied, then, Lord, don't just wash my feet. Wash my hands. Wash my head. Like, I want to jump in the shower then. I mean, I love Peter's reaction to that, right? Like, give me a bath. Now look what Jesus said in verse 10. Jesus answered, those who have already had a bath, those who are already believers, those who are already saved, those who are already a Christian, those who've already experienced a washing of rebirth or regeneration, meaning they've been born again spiritually. Those who've already had a bath need only to wash their feet. The whole body's clean. So here's what Jesus is saying. Peter, you've already had a spiritual bath. But Peter, your feet's gotten dirty. And you need me to wash your feet. Meaning this. There's nothing we can do that's going to change our sonship. God our Father. We're his son or daughter. But there are things we do that really break our fellowship with God. There's things we do. There, there's roads we travel that he didn't want us to go, but because he's merciful and graceful, he allows it, and we get dirty. Okay, so verse 5 said, the washing of regeneration, meaning this. There is this bat, there, there's this born-again experience that we have. It, it's the same concept in John chapter 3. John chapter 3, where John 3, 17, that really famous verse is found. Uh, actually, some of you probably heard of John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son. Whoever believes will have everlasting life. That's in the context of this guy named Nicodemus, this really smart religious guy who comes to Jesus and he just can't get it. Like his eyes don't see it. And Jesus says to him, Nicodemus, you got to be born again, man. Like all this stuff, you're trying to earn your way into heaven. It's not going to work. You got to take a bath. You're dirty. And there's nothing you can do to cleanse yourself. Uh, Nicodemus. And so Jesus says, you've got to be born again. So when you are regenerated through the washing of, of the blood of Christ, you've been washed, you've been born again. But as Christians, unfortunately, what do we do? We continue to sin because there is now a battle between the spiritual side of us that has been birthed and the fleshly side of us that we all live in. And they are at constant war with one another. Therefore, we think evil thoughts. We say things. We do things. We know we shouldn't say or do. We slander people. We gossip. We lie. We have a wrong attitude. We need our feet washed. 1 John 1, 9 says, If you confess your sins... God is faithful. He's just to forgive you of your sins. I love this word. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So hear this. If you're a believer in Jesus, you've experienced a rebirth. You, you're, you're not born again again. Does that make sense? 
Like you're only born into the family of God one time. You're birthed into that family when you believe and confess Christ. You're, you're only born once because, well, you're born already. Like if you're a believer, that's who you are. And so if you're a Christian, you don't need to bathe again. That's what Jesus is telling Peter. But what do you do? You, but you do need to have your feet washed. Because it's so easy. Instead of following the way of the wor- word, to follow the way of the world, even as a believer. And when we do that, guess what? Your feet get dirty. And Jesus has to wash that. Jude, uh, there's, 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 it's just Jude. <laughs> there's not a chapter. Um, Jude. But we would say Jude 121 says this. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Meaning keep yourselves in, in, in walking in fellowship with God, experiencing His love so that your feet don't get dirty. Um, I, I remember before graduating high school, so coming out of my junior year, going into my senior year, um, the things of God meant nothing to me. Uh, never had a Bible, never read a Bible, uh, never prayed. Uh, my team, we would pray. If the, if the game was going to be a, a hard game, uh, we would pray the Lord's Prayer. And I just, I was so baffled. How do all you guys know how to say this? Like, what, where did you get the instructions on how to say whatever it is you guys are saying? And, and, and so it just wasn't important. But then all of a sudden, spiritual things inside of me, like, like they started coming alive. Like all of a sudden, somebody was waking me up to this other side of me that I knew nothing of. I, I would tell you it was a rebirth. Uh, it was like uh, there was a new JJ being born. Right? And it wasn't the one of the flesh. It wasn't me trying to make my life better. Uh, it wasn't me trying to do anything different. I just all of a sudden, things I used to do, I started feeling bad towards those things. And I'm like, what is going on right now? And, and someone shared with me, like, that's the conviction of the Spirit because God desires a relationship. God wants you to know Him, to be right with Him. And, and that's how I came into a relationship with Christ when I asked God to forgive me of those things that I've always done in the flesh, those sins, and that I would be washed in the work of the cross so that I could experience a new me, being born again. 1 Peter 1, 3 says it like this. Because of His great mercy. That's why his mercy. He's given us a new birth. I did nothing. God showed mercy on me. It's a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus into an inheritance that's imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept for you in heaven. There's nothing you did to earn it. There's nothing you can do to lose it. But we're to live and walk in it. And so as we close, I want you to think of this really for the unbeliever and for the believer. For the unbeliever, we were all sinners, condemned, rightfully so. And yet God chose to pardon us, to forgive us by the work of his son on a cross, dead buried, rose again. That's the new life. Have you experienced that? For those of us who are believers, it's not that we need a bath today, but we need our feet washed. There was a a saying during this time, may the dust or the dirt of your rabbi always be upon you. Because they would have these bathhouses, you'd take a bath, but then obviously the streets, the paths were of dirt. You wore sandals, so your feet were exposed. So the thought was this. Either you're going to have the dust or the dirt of your rabbi on you, or you're going to have the dirt and the dust of the world on you. Which one are you following? So the thought was, 
that you would stay so close to your rabbi that even his dust would be upon you. And some of us, man, we made a commitment one day, God, that's what we're going to do. We're going to stay so close to you, when you take a step, the dust gets on me. And something happens. And somehow, some way, we started traveling a different road. At first, maybe we felt it, maybe we saw it, looked different. But then after a while, it's like we just became used to it. And we've been walking the road of the world and the dirt and all the ugliness of the world has gotten on us and we didn't even see it. Like, how did this happen? And Jesus today has a towel and a basin of water. He's going, look, you don't have to be, you don't have to take a bath. But I want to wash your feet. I want to cleanse you. Hey, where, where are you today? The believer who needs your feet washed? Or the unbeliever who needs to take a bath, confessing, calling on Christ? Wherever you may be, we want to give you an opportunity for you to pray, sit in this moment of what you need to do. Not what I need to do, but what is the Spirit leading you to do with this? So if you would close your eyes, bow your heads. No one's going to come to you. No one's going to embarrass you. But wow, we, we, we missed. Like if we just didn't give you a chance to respond, knowing that Jesus is calling you, wooing you back to himself. Enemy's going to tell you, oh man, you're too dirty. You smell. You've been on this road too long. It's the only road you know. Jesus is desperately calling you home, calling you back to him. You get to choose which direction your feet walk today. You're going to walk in the path of your rabbi, walk in the path of the world. If you're, if you're what I've said today, an unbeliever, a sinner in need of saving, condemned, there is a God that has part in you. But by faith, you, you, you put your hope, your trust in him. Receive the gift by calling on him. I, I want to help you do that. So I'm going to lead you in a prayer. No one's looking. No one's going to embarrass you. But in the silence of your moment, in your bathhouse, would you be willing to walk in and allow God to bathe you, cleanse you, for you to be born again, experience a, a spiritual birth? Father, thank you for loving me. God, my sin is obvious. God, my sin is everywhere. And yet it was so hard for me to see. So God, I come before you asking you to forgive me of those things I've done that are so far from you. Sinful, shameful, selfish way I've lived. God, I'm before you in this little house asking you to bathe me. God, I believe in you. My hope's in you. My faith is in you. My trust is in you. God, thank you that you called me into yourself as a son or a daughter of you, the king. Again, no one's going to come to you, but if that was the prayer of your heart today, we had four or five people in the nine o'clock service that that was me. Just by you raising your hand, would you just say, Pastor Jay, that was me today. I needed it. But I've never been bathed. That was, would you just raise your hand if you prayed that prayer with me? God bless you, man. See you. God bless. I also want to guide us in another prayer. Maybe a harder prayer for some of you. Because you remember a day that you prayed something similar to that where you became a follower of Jesus. So God, I'm going to I'm in love with you. My passion, my heart is to follow you. Nothing's going to stop that. You don't know how you got off on the wrong road. Your feet are dirty. Again, you don't need a bath. But I just, if you could picture just Jesus there with a basin of water, 
Come on, I want to wash your feet. Many of you, maybe like Peter, like, Jesus, I'm the one who got them dirty. I'm the one who needs to clean. You can't do anything. So would you pray, Jesus, I'm sorry for wherever I went, however I got there. God, I even told you I wouldn't do that. Yet, God, I'm coming back to you today. Asking you, please cleanse this dirt. God, I don't like the way I look. I don't like the way I smell. God, I don't like the things I've done. So would you wash me? God, thank you for restoring me unto yourself. God, thank you that you love me. God, in a love that is unexplainable. God, help me to allow your dust to be the only thing that gets on me. God, I want to follow you, live for you. Again, with your eyes closed, head bowed. If that was your prayer, would you just raise your hand? We had everybody all over the room. and God bless you, man. God bless you. Hey, in response to the love of God, how great a salvation. Would you just stand to your feet? We're going to worship together.